Welcome into the Gig'em 24-7 Sports Podcast. I am Andrew Hattersley, joined by Brian Peroni, as always. Brian, the dead period is is lifted, and recruiting is back underway. A&M will have a lot of visitors on campus the next two weekends. I know you and I were both out on the out on the road this weekend. How how was your weekend? Oh, uh, not bad at all. Yeah, I mean, got to go to camps, going to hit some high schools this week. Coaches are out and about. So, you know, it feels like, a, you know, there's no offseason in football, but it feels like, you know, the offseason is beginning. Coaches can only be out, out for like two weeks or whatever until the dead period starts again at the end of this month. But, you know, still, man, it's nice to – to be back in a little bit of a routine. Yeah, no doubt. You and I, Saturday, we had the next level camp in Houston and Sunday it was, it was in Dallas long couple of days. They split everything up into two sessions. What I, I don't remember them doing that in the past or if that's no, kind of it was just new... one, f- one field with every position on it before. Yep. Which was kind of a, and you know, use some outside fields and things like that, but um, got to see a lot of young prospects and, and we'll certainly talk about that. You put out your big board, uh, for the 2025 class, which it feels like you were working on since basically the new year going through yeah. film and all that. So there's a lot of I, words. on that. I story. highly encourage people check that out. If you're um, a recruiting junkie and looking to get into the 2025 class. And, and we'll talk about a couple of those names as well, because um, a and is going to have a couple of them on campus later this month. Uh, Brian, looking ahead to a junior day, A&M will have their first junior day coming up this weekend on January 21st. And for me, quarterbacks kind of take center stage, and it's going to be a big weekend on that front with both Walker White and Aaron Nolan expected on campus. And a uh, big weekend for Bobby Petrino to be able to, yeah. you know, kind of sit down with both those guys and talk with them. I think, you know, I would have them along with DJ Lagway as, as probably the, the three – that AM is 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 primarily going after right now. Will Hammond's in the mix as well. He got an offer last week. Yeah, but Mark, Marcos Davila as well. Marcos Davila also got an offer. So, you know, that that kind of group feels like the you know the quarterbacks to keep an eye on right now. But um looking ahead to that, your thoughts on, on bringing both of them in the same weekend as well. I mean, I don't think either guy's, you know, ready to make a commitment yeah. or close to making a commitment. And Petrino also, you know, is is evaluating these guys. He was at Missouri State. Missouri State wasn't going to land, you know, Aaron Nolan or, uh, you know, I, either guy. So, or, or Walker White or, you know, Will Hammond or any of them. So, you know, he hasn't been truly evaluating these uh, these quarterbacks for very long. And, you know, that's quarterback makes or breaks a head coach, an OC, you know, yep. a quarterback coach. You know, so you you want to be sure you got a hit rate. They got a real good one on campus, obviously, in Connor Wigman. But, uh you know, after that, you know, you, you need, you need guys going forward. So I don't think they're going to, you know, push for a commitment this early from any mm-hmm. of the guys. So, you know, why not have both? If you can, you know, if that's the time they can get in town, start building relationships. Nobody's met uh, Bobby Petrino before. So, so yeah, I don't, I, I don't really think it's an issue. Um, yeah. You know, it'd be interesting to see if they get Marcos Davila on campus. He's been committed to TCU mm-hmm. for a while, but you know, still is at least listening to schools. Will Hammond uh, from Hutto is a, a tech commit. He's picked up a lot of offers lately, you know, like a Auburn, I think. I, I don't know, AM, Oregon, or some others. But he uh, he actually says he's locked into tech. He's not taking any other visits. You know, if something happens at tech, then he'll look around. But uh, but yeah, I'd say it's the three you talked about, and then Davila are, the, are sort of the ones to keep an eye on for sure. No doubt. And with, with Aaron Nolan, I think one other noteworthy thing is um he'll be coming into town with debron gatling and those two have have obviously known each other since peewee and so um and they played together you know aaron, aaron nolan told me when we talked last month he he admitted he's like yeah i'm not gonna lie to you when i was a when it was a big down the guy i was going to was debron gatling and so those two are are obviously really really close and so having having him on in town as well for this weekend will certainly help. And, and Walker white, you know, he's, he's picked up quite a few offers over the past month or so. And, you know, I think he's, he's got a pretty busy, pretty busy stretch of, of visits coming up and, and uh, A&M will, will certainly get the chance to host him. And uh, you know, we'll, We'll see. I think for him, he just wants to learn more, like you said, learn more about Bobby Petrino, get to see what all these different schools have to offer. Ole Miss is in the mix for him. Arkansas has had him on campus before as well, obviously. And so, uh, you know, interested. One of the big things for me is is just interested to start getting 
gets feedback out of this week on, on Bobby Petrino, the recruiter, because he is going to have to, obviously mm -hmm. he was brought in play in, in town to call plays and, and all that, but to be able to get their feedback on, on kind of their initial impressions of him, um, this will be, this will be a big weekend for him, obviously. And, and he certainly knows that he's been around the game a long time. So, uh, but it, it'll be, it'll be a big weekend overall, not even, not just out on the, on the quarterback front, Ryan Wingo, Elijah rushing, Ty Anthony Smith are a couple of the expected names in town, um, along with Walker White and and Aaron Nolan. Uh, for Ryan Wingo, this is obviously he's he's been he's been to campus a couple times now, and um, you know I think that that's going to be that's going to be a, a a tough battle. Obviously, Tennessee is a school that's that's had a lot of buzz for him, um, but but good to get him back on campus for the third time. Oh, yeah. And so Ryan Wingo, five-star receiver from St. Louis. His brother, Ronnie, played at Arkansas a while back, was a running back. And the head coach at the time was, you know, the common theme in this episode was Bobby Petrino. Petrino has known the family for a long time. So Wingo has been to A&M before. He's been twice to A&M already. And now you add a familiar face at A&M who's in charge of the offense, you know, an offense that they know well because his brother played in it before going to the NFL. So, uh, so yeah, that uh, that definitely does not hurt with him, and that would be uh, huge for the Aggies to, you know, to 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 truly be one of the teams to watch there, and possibly mm -hmm. even land him because you know he's a stud, and you you know he would come in if you land him, he comes in when Evan Stewart's a junior, and uh, you know most people expect Stewart to be gone after three years, so you know it'd sort of be one year with him and then a changing of the guard kind of deal, and he's that same type of player, you know, he can play inside, outside, he's got speed catches everything so so yeah the Petrino deal is big there and you mentioned Petrino as a recruiter I mean so he's pretty much just been a head coach you know other yeah. than his uh one month as an OC at at UNLV <laughs> very right, busy month here. he had at UNLV yeah, yeah. <laughs> so he's just been a head coach he was an NFL head coach when he was a head coach he wasn't known as a recruiter and yeah. some head coaches are some aren't Jimbo Fisher is a recruiter very hands-on some coaches are hands-off they let their assistants do that you know they obviously meet with the the kids to offer him. Petrino was not seen as like, you know, that really hands-on recruiter. So even when he was, you know, doing it, he wasn't that, but as an OC and as a quarterback coach, you have to be, you know, at least with the quarterbacks you have to be, but he's also been offering, you know, players at other positions. He's offered some receivers, you know, just, you know, people that he may have have ties with. So you're seeing that, uh, you know, that he's, he's made that adjustment. He seems to be, you know, doing fine with it at least so far. No doubt. Oh, the early returns have obviously been been positive in the in the couple of weeks that he's he's been here. And, um, you know, this. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm I'm eager to start talking to guys this weekend after they can get on campus and kind of meet with him in person and and, you know, see what they kind of what kind of strikes them about getting to know him and, and his mm -hmm. personality, uh, you know, should should provide some good insight on on that front. Um, sticking with, you know, the future classes, you put out your big your your 2025 early look what you know there obviously obviously there's a ton of names on there and um some names a&m offered recently like michael fasusi and kamari and morgan um who i got the chance to see this weekend and both look looked really impressive uh but early takeaways just from from any themes that stood out or 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 some big things that struck you yeah so it's been a little bit since offensive tackles have been you know elite in Texas or, or, or mold several of them. Um, this class is going to have at least three, the three guy, the three offensive tackles at the top, Lamont Rogers from Mesquite Horn, Michael Fasusi, as you mentioned from Louisville and Jonte Newman from Bridgeland and Cypress Wigman's old school. Uh, they will be big time national recruits. Logan Tram and Tyler Thomas have a chance to, to be that as well, but those three will be big time. But really the hardest position was wide receiver because it is like loaded with guys that already have offers or have put up huge numbers or, you know, guys that we've seen in camp that have tested well. I mean, really the the receiver group, you could have slotted almost any of them in that in that top five and, uh, you know, not had an issue. Same thing with running back. There may not, you know, the running back, you sort of got two headliners and Tory Blaylock from uh, from Atascacita and Tiger Ryden from DeSoto A&M has offered both of them, but let's just say a &M doesn't land either one. I mean, there is a lot of talent in that position, um, you know, that they, that they could go after in state or obviously out of state too, but, 
really. So, so running backs, receivers, and then sort of the top half of offensive tackle are absolutely loaded. And I, I think this class has a chance to be, you know, just, just as a whole and the depth and the top end has a chance to be the best class in probably, you know, five or six years. It, it's really early, but it is a chance to be really good. Yeah, the the buzz the buzz around the offensive line is 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 really bubble and and you look at a guy like Michael Fasusi, he's he's an intriguing name, and um, I'll have a story. I had a chance to speak to him this week, and he actually started out along the defensive line, and then made the move over to offensive tackle. His coaches convinced him that was going to be his his future position, and pretty smart. pretty smart move on yeah. on that front. Um, so he's he's a guy that's that's still learning the position. Um, still learning a lot of things technique wise, but when you watch him move around and, and, and kind of his frame, he's added, he's, he's added some muscle already in the off season. Um, talked about that a little bit and, uh, has the frame that, that you ideally look for. And, and was a guy that, that people were paying close attention to yesterday as he went against a guy like Camorian Morgan, who looked really impressive as, as with a long frame coming off the edge. Um, you mentioned Lamont Rogers. I mean, he's a, he's a two sport athlete. He's a basketball guy as well. And, you know, he wanted to come to the the next level, but talking to some people from Mesquite Horn, the basketball staff wouldn't let him, uh, yeah, too bad wouldn't let him do it because they were like, no, he's our, he's our center. He's our five in, in <laughs> basketball and we're in the middle of district play. And so we can't, afford to lose a guy like that if he were to get injured or something like that during district play so they were like no 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 we're he, he, yeah, he's think, not going to, he's not going to a camp he's in the middle of part, district yeah. play but goes to show you i mean he's he's an important piece on you know as a two speed two sport athlete and a guy i feel like we've been hearing about for for at least a year now and and you're right that receiver room you could just you know decorian moore is obviously a guy that that everybody kind of looks at, but just the names. I mean, Taz Williams has, has a ton of interest as well. And uh, Dion DeBlanc down at, uh, down in, in your area in Houston. Uh, there's just a ton of names that you can go down, down the list. And uh, you know, it feels like a lot of them have been on seven on seven and showcases and all that yeah. already getting their names out there. And, and that is one, probably one reason I know you mentioned there seems to be a lot more names now than there usually is. You know, there's so many more showcases and 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 chances to to kind of get exposure now. It feels like that's kind of paid off in this this 2025 class. Uh, you know, Brian, we're just touching real quick on, you know, and I, I think a significant note from last week on on the co- on a coaching staff front. We're still seeing how this coaching staff kind of comes together and there's expected to be probably more moves in the next couple of days and weeks to come. But Tommy Robinson, um, I think a move that, that caught some people by surprise Um, reported last week and confirmed that, that his contract was not renewed. Uh, You know, with three straight thousand yard rushers, we talked about it last week. Uh, You know, I think a lot of people felt like he was, he would be in the fold moving forward, but your reaction to him to, to you know, AM going in a different direction at the running back spot. You know, uh, you know, he was a guy, and I had listed my thoughts about, you know, not not what I, you know, opinions or anything, but what, yeah. what I thought might happen or was going to happen with the offensive staff. And, you know, I think, you know, James Coley was the only one that was like definitely safe that was, yeah. you know, before any offensive coordinator was hired. So Coley's safe. And, you know, I told people, I was like, everybody else, there's at least a possibility. And people were like, you know, well, not Tommy Robinson. I was like, well, I mean, yeah. I think it's at least a possibility. I was surprised that, you know, let's just, I, who knows if there are going to be others, but if there's just one move, it was surprising that, that it was him. Yeah. Um, but I do think, you know, Petrino has to have some autonomy. I think that was a, a reason that, you know, he took the job, you know, you saw him uh, wait a little bit before taking the job. He and Jimbo had talked about sort of the autonomy, yeah. not just with play calling, but you know, with other things. And so, I think he needs at least one of his own guys in there. And, and, you know, I think that, uh, you know, Robinson may have just been the victim of circumstances, you know, if he, yeah. if Petrino had, uh, had a guy in mind that he liked. Um, so I don't know if it's necessarily anything Tommy Robinson did. I mean, recruits really liked him, <clears throat> you know, Jimbo became, you know, Bryce, the Bryce Anderson recruitment. I mean, everybody remembers Jimbo, you know, personally got involved there, was very involved and, and, you know, just made Bryce a priority. But Tommy Robinson is the one who landed him at LSU when he was just a sophomore. Yep. And 
when Tommy Robinson went to a and he's the reason that Bryce decommitted from uh, from LSU is that, you know, when he decommitted, it was it looked like he was going to immediately flip to A&M and then, you know, Texas got involved in others. But Tommy Robinson was huge in that. You know, the Anderson family loved him. Uh, Ruben Owens, Jimbo, you know, obviously went there, had that in home, flipped him. But Tommy Robinson is a guy they really like. So he's a guy that recruits like not just running backs, but other crews. Dalton Brooks was a big fan. Yeah. So, uh, you know, whoever uh, comes in, you know, whether it be Scotty Montgomery, uh, who's with the Colts or anybody else, uh, you know, needs to have sort of that big personality and who's good at forming relationships just so A&M doesn't fall off recruiting. You know, I'm sure that Petrina is going to bring a really good coach in. You know, usually the running back coach is your best recruiter on staff and you just tell them, hey, just just tell the running backs to run with the ball. You know, yeah. you, know you don't even really have to coach them. You <laughs> find know, a hole. A lot of times, a, yeah, yeah, it's guys who have never even coached running backs before because like – or never played running back, coach running back. You know, they're like, they're good recruiters. Stick them there because anybody could tell a guy to, to carry the ball forward. But uh, <laughs> but I think Petrina is going to bring in somebody who's a good tactician and – but they need to be they need to be a good recruiter as well because you gotta you know you gotta pick up the slack that you're missing now with Tommy Robinson. No doubt. And Scotty Rob Scotty Montgomery is, you know, obviously has if that is the guy he has, um, and it's it's a name that's been mentioned. He's a guy that has college experience, has been obviously in the NFL with with the Indianapolis Colts. So um I think that would be that would be a, a very solid option if if that's the guy that AM ends up going with. I do think, you know, just getting the pulse around DFW. You know, I, I, it did strike me how, how well liked Tommy Robinson was as, as his kind of area recruited. That's going to be really important going forward, speaking to a lot of people at, at next level and, and around there just about Tommy Robinson. And, uh, you know, he had, he, he, he was kind of starting to set up his DFW visits. And a lot of people were kind of saying, well, you know, who's going to kind of have, dfw now and so you know T- terry price is 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 certainly a guy that has a lot of yeah. dfw <clears throat> ties but uh, that's going to be that's going to be an important part of this hire or, or whoever takes over the the dfw role is tommy robinson had some really strong relationships there um you know and it was all you know trey wisner was a guy they were still kind of going after late in the cycle to add to to um to the fold with Ruben Owens and, mm-hmm. you know, those I spoke with kind of credited the, the work that Tommy Robinson was doing behind the scenes to, to really be involved there and, um, uh, and had a good relationship with him. And so, uh, you know, I think that that's one big thing for me is that, that I'll be looking at is whoever does get, end up getting hired, you know, what are those DFW ties? And if he does not have DFW ties, who do they kind of put in there to, to kind of, uh, make sure you know recruiting doesn't slip off in in the DFW area. So that's going to be really important. Um, we're going to touch on a couple bio cell topics, bringing that back again for for this week right after a quick break. Welcome back into the Gigum 24-7 Sports Podcast. I am Andrew Hattersley, joined by Brian Peroni. Brian, bringing back buyer sell. Last <laughs> week was a little interesting. <laughs> a little, <laughs> you know, I don't, to be fair, I don't think anybody kind of saw saw coming what, what happened in the, that national the TCU, game. The TCU-Georgia game. Georgia game. The, the TCU-Georgia game. That thing was over. I didn't. I have I have not turned off a, a national championship by the end of the third <laughs> quarter in a long while. But I was kind of like, all right. Once I once Georgia hits fifty, I'll 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 turn this off and give it a break, and it, and it just felt like a matter of time. I mean, it was just <laughs> match on on every level, every you know, even you and I were laughing. That Nick Saban was even kind of laughing on the on the halftime show about you know just the mismatch along the defensive line up front, just all over the place. The mismatches were just everywhere. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so you're. I think the question last week was it. TC's with, going to keep it within 10 or two scores. Keep it within one score. Yeah. We, oh, yeah. And I was like, come on. That's fact. Definitely. Like, they've been good all year coming back in the second half. And <laughs> I used, I was like, hey, you know, I, I'll probably end up on old Texas Exposed when it's 55 to three. And that was a huge exaggeration. It was never going to be that. And the score's worse than that. What was it? 
65 to 65 seven. to like, seven. Yeah. I was like, you know what? Just put 70 up. You know, they could have scored on that last <laughs> just drive. Keep going. Just, keep... just do it because it's funny at this point. <laughs> So yeah, we were a bit off. Maybe the other ones I'll be on. You were right though, man. You took the. You said yeah. You hey, said they wouldn't. I we'll see. I my my big gamble is the the thousand yard rushers. So we'll see. We could each have one that goes. Oh yeah, man. You probably little... need to. You need to keep the uh, keep a tab of these, and we'll see. Yeah, I'll keep the, a tab of these the every season. week. And at the end of the year, we'll kind of see what what came right and what what came to fruition that'll be like kind of a revision podcast so I'm already that one i'm already yeah, one, you're, man i'm you're, you're starting already, behind the eight ball you're already starting a bit behind yeah. the eight ball which is okay it's so it's i have early. i you once again on I, I don't know your uh i don't you haven't told you me you don't the, know yeah i keep you, i keep week, you on your so. toes yeah um so. this one this one's kind of you know it's it's more of just a uh you know i don't know how to measure this one but uh you know, there's a lot of everybody's obviously doing their looks already ahead to 2023, as you as you would expect when the national championship finishes up. Everybody immediately starts with kind of their bold <clears> prediction, <throat> and as you would expect, A and M is um, a bounce back candidate for everybody. Um, but I think I think it's honestly too early to to look at that. But um, A and M is the most intriguing team in the to watch in the SEC West going into next fall. Are you buying or selling that? Okay, so SEC West, you got Alabama. They're going to be good. You know, they're always good. Yeah. LSU is supposed to be good again. I mean, they won the won the West this year. Ole Miss, whatever. Mississippi State. I mean, you got a new coach there. Arkansas. Who am I missing? I'm missing one school. Oh, Auburn. Auburn's Auburn. Auburn. So yeah, I think it just by by default. I mean, obviously though, A and M has a ton of A and M's got the talent. They got five stars at like every position, seemingly. Yeah. They got a quarterback who's returning. Who, you know, Wigman didn't throw an interception this year. Some of the throws should have been interceptions, but he didn't throw an interception this year. Yeah. Um, you know, as a true freshman, he's coming back with experience under his belt. You got you know Evan Stewart with experience under his belt. People are going to be watching, like, who's 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 the next 1,000-yard running back? So, yeah, I'd say so, because a and is such an enigma. Like, they keep being voted, you know, preseason or the way too early, you know, top 10, because they, you know, it's like you look on paper, they have all this talent. Yeah. Well, they have a lot of talent coming back next year. The way too early rankings do not have them in the top 10 this year. People have gotten gun-shy on that. So, yeah, some people have them in the 21-25 range. I've seen a couple that don't have A&M in there at all. And that's, you know, completely new thing. Even, you know, yeah, they finished five and seven, but, you know, you're still like, you know, they have the talent. So I think a lot of people are going to be watching them and maybe without those expectations, you know, without starting at, you know, number seven overall as the season begins without as much pressure, it could be, uh, you know, it could be different. I don't know. But I do think, yeah, with the SEC West and maybe even the whole SEC, I think yeah. most guys. We could even going, that out to yeah. the whole SEC. Yeah, yeah. Do, most I, guys are going to be on A&M. No doubt. I think, you know, you're going to have some some second-year jobs like Florida. I think there's going to be a lot of eyes on them. Obviously, that quarterback room still feels like kind of a mess with everything going on there. And Without Jaden and, Rashada. And Rashada, everything going yeah. out with Jaden Rashada. And, you know, they could be pinning their hopes on Graham Mertz next year. And and he's got experience, obviously. For me, yeah, I, I kind of had them as, as the most intriguing team uh, – in the SEC also, because when you look at the eyeballs, there's going to be a lot of eyeballs on, on Bobby Petrino and how does this offense look? And from week one to week three, there's going to be people already kind of trying to judge, is this offense more explosive? Uh, you know, I think people are going to certainly be keeping a close watch on Jimbo Fisher. This is a huge year for a and you know, heading into coming off the, the five and five, the five and seven debacle, obviously, um, with Connor Wigman, with Evan Stewart, with Moose Muhammad, you know they they've lost a lot of depth to the transfer portal. But as you mentioned, they've got a lot of starters back, and I think people really want to see is this kind of the year that 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 they take the step forward and and you know yeah, like I was I was looking at at a lot of these polls, and they're kind of in the twenties, and some um, I saw an article that. That had had A and M from a worst to first candidate going kind of TCU style, and I was saying we're not going to touch that. We're not we're not going <laughs> to no, continue no. continue going that route because otherwise you're just you know you're building things up. I think this is a fascinating team to watch, though. It could honestly it could go well or it could go, it could could go terribly, and and it 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 
it really good. And, you know, cause I think a lot of people are saying, okay, well, you've got 19 of 22 starters back. That's great. But that's also from a team that went five and seven, you know, yeah. you've got to, you've got to still make the jump in order to, to actually make that improvement. So I think it's going to be interesting. It's going to be really interesting to watch. And, and obviously there's going to be no shortage of storylines when you come to sec media days, we haven't even had our, our summer excitement. Like we had the past two, two oh, years. Yeah, and, and so I mean, Kiffin, we'll, Kiffin's trying. He's, he's Kiffin's trying to make trying. it a thing. He's, so. he's trying to make it. Th- he's trying to weasel his way into kind of the, you know, he, but what he doesn't realize, he's picking the wrong avenue. You're going through social media. Jimbo doesn't even have social media. Yeah, yeah. He's he's just... picking, <laughs> like, try a little harder. You're trying the one thing that Jimbo doesn't even have. Yeah. So, um, second one, we got two today. Um, you know, like there's, there's, there's obviously been a lot of talk about the offensive line, rightly so, um, the secondary and and rebuilding that. For me. Fixing the run defense is the number one agenda item this off season. Are you buying or selling that? No, I'm going to sell. Um, obviously, it's it's a huge deal, but you know, A and M's got all those defensive linemen. They've got linebackers. You know, you they haven't added one, but you know, you got to hope they have an, a portal linebacker with experience that comes in. Um, maybe Omar Spates from from Oregon State if they could get him. Yeah. So, you know, I think number one deal, you know, we talked about the offense last week. A&M only averaged, what, like 22 points or something? It's the offensive line. And that's why, you know, I get back to that, you know, them not taking any offensive linemen in the portal. That's their plan. I think it's a mistake, but, you know, they they trust the guys on campus. But the offensive line was um, not good, <laughs> you know, to put it nicely. This, this past year, and A&M has become a school that is known for its offensive line play. And so just how downhill – is gone in, in sort of the past two years. I think that is the number one thing. And I think the team goes how the O-line goes. Yeah, see, I am I am going towards the, the run defense. I mean, they gave up 210 yards per game in the SEC or yeah, in good. the country last year. That's by far the worst. Um, South Carolina gave up 198. And everybody else, even, even Florida at 12th, gave up 175. For me, it just – it allowed teams to to dictate the game too much. It it allowed it allowed them to control the clock and and um, you know we saw that come up in a couple of games. Appalachian State for one, uh, you know the time of possession disparity in games like that were was was astounding. Um, and you saw what Ole Miss did to them, and with I think some some backbreaking momentum plays. And I don't think like like you mentioned, I don't think they've they've quite fixed the run defense yet. And I think it's important when you look at the next month or two, um, no question. I think the offensive line and the run defense are kind of the top two concerns. I do think they still need to add a linebacker in the transfer portal. Mason Cobb obviously would have been, I think an an important add to go along with Edger and Cooper. Um, Omar Spates is certainly a guy that that's intriguing. I think should have, should have a a lot of suitors. Uh, You know, I know, a&M was mentioned as one. Somebody mentioned Alabama as one as well. Uh, you know, he hasn't he hasn't really done any interviews yet, and and or taken any visits. I don't believe yet. Uh, but but intriguing name to watch as well. And I I I really look at the run defense and and that linebacker spot specifically. I know they've got a lot of talent along the defensive line. I think seeing them take that that next jump and and being able to be more disciplined in, in assignments, alignment, all the things that that they kind of talk about. Um but yeah that that run defense I think uh because because if you can if you can get a little better at stopping the run, get a lot better actually at stopping the run now you kind of get teams into third and longs, third and third and difficult situations where you can pin your ears back and, and maybe create more, more turnovers. So, um, you know, A&M was, was fine defensively from a scoring defense perspective, but um, I do look that as, as a massive agenda item with the offensive line being number two. Um, so, you know, re- really, really, those two areas I think are going to be the two areas people are watching the closely in the spring ball and then the receiver position as well. And, and just seeing how that continues to develop. Uh, but that's going to go ahead and do it for us today. Thanks again for, 
for joining us and and talking a little. We went 30 minutes today, um, just talking some junior day visits yeah. and and all that. Gonna gonna be back next week to uh, break down A and M's first junior day weekend and look ahead. National signing day is just around the corner as well. We feels like we just hit the early signing period, um, and so we'll be, be be back to kind of look ahead to that. Um, as always, if you like these videos, like, share, and 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 subscribe to our YouTube channel. Uh, if you listen to us on iTunes or Spotify, be sure to give us a five-star review and enjoy the rest of your week, and, and we'll be back soon.